VO2max is considered to be one of the best predictors of longevity by Dr. Peter Atia. You know, the association between uh, high VO2 max and longevity is so clear. And conversely, the association between low VO2 max and mortality is so clear that the idea that VO2 max is the single greatest predictor of lifespan of any measurable number we have um, is, is quite remarkable. I agree that VO2 max is incredibly important. However, a lot of people in my community and elsewhere are questioning Peter's claims about the importance of VO2 max. In this video, I'm going to go through the studies about VO2 max and mortality to see how important it really is. So make sure you click a like and subscribe for future videos about living longer and staying healthier. So how important is VO2 max then? Indeed, there are a lot of studies finding a link between a higher VO2 max and reduced risk of mortality and other chronic diseases. Peter Atia has used this study to exemplify the magnitude of benefits you get from a high VO2 max. They looked at over 7,500,000 5, US veterans aged 30 to 95. All the participants did a treadmill test in the beginning to measure their VO2 max, and then they were followed up for up to 20 years. What they found was that the people who had the highest VO2 max had the lowest risk of mortality over these 20 20 years. The fittest people had on average a VO2 max of 14.3 mets, which is 50 milliliters per kilogram per minute of VO2 max. The least fit individuals had a VO2 max of 4.7 mets, which is 16.45 milliliters per kilogram per minute. The difference in mortality risk between the highest and lowest VO2 max was 300%, which is a massive difference. Smoking usually increases your risk of mortality by 100 to 200%, and in this same study on the veterans, they found that smoking was associated with only a 40% increased risk of mortality. This is one of the examples that Peter has used to exemplify the importance of VO2 max and how big an effect it has on your risk of mortality. And it hints that a low VO2 max, as based on this study, would be equally as bad as smoking and even worse. The caveat here is that this 300% difference was between the extremely fit individuals, the fittest of the fit, and the least fit individuals. As you can see from the graph, there's a lot of other subgroups in this study that fall somewhere between very fit and not so fit. A VO2 max of 4.7 mets or 16.45 milliliters per kilogram per minute, which is the least fit group, is considered the frailty threshold, below which you're functionally dependent of caretaking and you're not able to take care of yourself physically. It's the unhealthiest and oldest of the people who are limited in what they do physically. Of course, there's going to be a massive difference in mortality between these people and the fittest in this study. So what's the difference in mortality between the fittest people and the second fittest people? People. The second highest group of fitness had a VO2 max of 12.1 mets or 42.35 milliliters per kilogram per minute. The difference in mortality between the extremely fit individuals with a VO2 max of 50 was 39%. That's not as big as the 300% between the extremely fit and the least fit individuals, but it's still quite high. And as you remember, in this same study, they found that smoking was linked to a 40% increased risk of mortality. So the difference in mortality between the extremely fit and the very fit individuals was equal to smoking. What about those who were considered just fit? The ones who were just fit had a VO2 max of 10.4 mets or 36.4 milliliters per kilogram per minute, and they had a 66% higher risk of mortality than those who were extremely fit. What about those who were moderately fit? Moderately fit individuals had a VO2 max of 9 mets, or 31.5 milliliters per kilogram per minute, and they had a 113% higher risk compared to the extremely fit individuals. And lastly, those with low fitness had a VO2 max of 7.1 mets, or 24.85 milliliters per kilogram per minute, which resulted in 188% higher risk of mortality compared to the extremely fit folks. That's still very eye-opening and thought-provoking. Those who were considered extremely fit with a VO2 max in their 50s still had about the same risk reduction as those who were smoking. Compared to the extremely fit individuals who had a VO2 max in their 50s, those who were also very fit with a VO2 max in their 40s had a 39% higher risk of mortality, which is equal to smoking in this same study. It's not the 400% difference as between the extremely fit and least fit individuals, but it's still quite a massive difference. So, is Peter at here right that a higher VO2 max is linked to longevity? It's certainly linked to a reduced risk of all-cause mortality and heart disease. Whether or not these people are going to live to 100 is not clear, because there are many unpredictable factors that determine how long you're going to live. However, if you do want to live longer, then increasing your VO2 max is one of the most reliable methods of doing so. And most of it comes from reducing your risk of mortality year by year. And if you have a lower risk of mortality year by year, then you are delaying death, essentially. The reason that that is the case 
is that VO2 max is a remarkable integrator of the work you have done to get fit. And that's why strength is a very close second. I agree with Peter that a low VO2 max is generally a sign of poor health. If you have a low VO2 max, then you're probably not exercising because in order to have a higher VO2 max, you need to train for it and you need to exercise. People who have a higher VO2 max generally are more physically active and that reflects in better health status. If you don't exercise at all or if you exercise less suboptimal amounts of exercise, then your VO2 max is going to be somewhat lower and that reflects in the mortality data as well. People who exercise generally more and they have a higher VO2 max have a lower risk of mortality. Exercising and training cardio specifically improves virtually all your biomarkers, blood sugar, cholesterol, blood pressure, inflammation, etc. So it is true that as an umbrella marker, it's very good for assessing the person's overall health. If a person has a low VO2 max, then it's very likely their other clinically relevant biomarkers are also suboptimal, like cholesterol or inflammation. Vice versa, if a person has a very high VO2 max, it's very likely that their other biomarkers are also optimal, such as their blood sugar or cholesterol. So how high should your VO2 max be? In the study that I just talked about, the lowest risk of mortality was with a VO2 max of 50 milliliters per kilogram per minute. In this study, the 50 milliliters per kilogram per minute was labeled as extremely fit, but in reality, that's not really like athletic level of fitness. Athletes and cyclists usually have a VO2 max of over 70. For the average person who exercises and stays fit, achieving a VO2 max of 50 isn't going to be that difficult, even in your 50s and 60s. Unless you're already in your 70s, everyone could have a VO2 max of 50 with consistent training. If you have a VO2 max in your 40s, so let's say you have a VO2 max of 42.3, which is, would be the very fit individual, if you increase your VO2 max to your 50s, then based on the study, you would also reduce your risk of mortality by up to 39% which is a significant difference. If your VO2 max is even lower than that, so let's say your VO2 max is 34.5 and you increase it to 42.5, then that's also going to reduce your risk of mortality quite significantly. And if you increase it to 50, then it's going to reduce your mortality even more. And having a higher VO2 max is significantly more important the younger you are. The younger you are, the higher your VO2 max should be because VO2 max starts declining after the age of 18 already. You should easily have your VO2 max above 50 and even above 55 in your 20s. In your 60s, it's going to be quite difficult to have your VO2 max above 50 unless you're a lifelong athlete. But your VO2 max should still be somewhere in your 40s when you're 60 years old. And there is evidence that 80-year-old athletes are able to maintain a VO2 max of 39, which for their age group is excellent. In your 80s, a VO2 max between 30 to 40 is excellent. But in your 20s, a VO2 max of 30 to 40 is very poor. There's little to no evidence that a VO2 max above 60 milliliters per kilogram per minute would be somehow better than the 50 milliliters per kilogram per minute, but that's mostly because there's you know, no studies on that. In the general population, being with a VO2 max of 50 is considered extremely fit, but it's actually somewhat, yeah, it's just fit, essentially. If you want to be extremely fit, then you would have to have a VO2 max in your 60s. But there's no data that 60 is better than 50 for longevity, at least. It's certainly better for athletic performance. Regardless, because VO2 max declines with age, you always want to be ahead of the curve to promote your future physical reserve. If you have a VO2 max of 30 milliliters per kilogram per minute in your 20s, then it's going to drop below the disability line in your 50s and 60s. The higher you start from with your VO2 max, the more time you have to stay healthy above the frailty line. If you have a VO2 max of 15 milliliters per kilogram per minute in your 80s, you won't be able to even take care of yourself and you'll be dependent of caretaking. I don't think anyone wants that, which is why it's important to increase your VO2 max and build up this VO2 max reserve the older you get. Before I continue, I want to briefly mention to you about one of my favorite longevity gadgets, which is the Bond Charge Infrared Sauna Blanket. It's a cheaper and more convenient way to take the sauna anywhere at any time. I've talked a lot about the benefits of regular sauna use. I believe taking the sauna regularly is the second best thing for your longevity after exercise. In fact, the sauna mimics a lot of the health benefits of exercise. The sauna is also effective for excreting heavy metals and other chemicals we're exposed to on a daily basis. The Bond Charge Infrared Blanket is made of pure leather and it's low in EMF. It's got a rating of 4.9 out of 5 based on 176 reviews, which is crazy. But I'm not surprised because I'm using the blanket almost every day and it gets the same job done as a regular sauna. Plus, it's easy to clean and you can store it under your bed. 
All right, back to the video. Another counter argument against VO2 max that is often used is that strength training and muscle mass is much more important than VO2 max. Muscle strength and muscle mass indeed decline with age, and low muscle is a predictor of mortality and other chronic diseases. However, muscle mass and muscle strength have a lower association with mortality than VO2 max, and a higher VO2 max is linked to a greater reduction in mortality risk than a higher muscle mass. Here's a great large study that proves that. A 2018 UK Biobank study looked at data from over half a million people and compared the risk reductions of higher cardiorespiratory fitness and grip strength, both alone as well as together. They found that the individuals with the highest cardiorespiratory fitness had a 35% lower risk of mortality compared to the lowest cardiorespiratory fitness. Those in the middle fitness category had a 24% lower risk in terms of grip strength than the highest grip strength category saw a 21% reduction in all cause mortality risk compared to the lowest grip strength category. So based on that, a higher cardiorespiratory fitness was linked to a greater a reduction in mortality risk than a higher grip strength. Even the middle category of cardiorespiratory fitness outperformed the highest category of grip strength, 24% versus 21%. However, the authors of the study did find that those with both high cardiorespiratory fitness and high grip strength saw a 47% reduction in mortality risk and 69% lower risk of heart disease mortality compared to the lowest categories. So if you compare head to head, then cardiorespiratory fitness provides greater risk reductions in mortality than higher muscle strength. But ideally, you want to have both. You want to have high grip strength and high cardiorespiratory fitness, although the benefits of grip strength and muscle strength appear to plateau at the intermediate level. Basically, you want to do both cardio and strength training for maximum risk reduction. In conclusion, cardiorespiratory fitness is incredibly important for longevity, and a higher VO2 max is just a reflection of your cardiorespiratory fitness. To have a higher VO2 max, you will need to train it. No one is really born with exceptionally high VO2 max, and unless you train for it, unless you actually do some form of exercise, then you're not going to see an increase in your VO2 max. Of course, there are ways to increase your VO2 max besides cardio. Some people can see an increase in their VO2 max with strength training as well if they have a poor cardio cardiorespiratory fitness to begin with, but to really optimize your VO2 max and get it into the lowest risk category of 50 milliliters per kilogram per minute and above, then you do need to do some specific cardio work. If you want to learn more about exercise and longevity and all the other aspects that relate to that, then check out my new book, The Longevity Leap, at thelongevityleap.com or the link in the description. Other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure you click a like and subscribe for future videos about living longer and staying healthier. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.